With an engine revving at 20,000 RPM, this piston accelerates from 0 to 60 miles per hour in 0.003 of a second. At this point, it has a mass of 2.5 tons and it pulls 10,000 G. And this is what 20,000 RPM sounds like. It's Mark Webber driving a 2006 Williams with a Cosworth CA 2006 and it's the highest revving F1 engine ever. It's been almost 20 years since this engine was released, so why haven't F1 engines, or any engines for that matter, gone above this magical 20,000 RPM? Well, it's more difficult than you might think, so today I'm gonna to explain why it's almost impossible to rev engines over 21,000 RPM. Now, first of all, why do we care so much about RPM? Well, RPM is how many times the crankshaft spins in a minute, and we care about RPM because higher RPMs typically means more power, and more power, well, means faster lap times. I spoke with Maria Thierard, head of powertrain engineering at the IFP school in France, to find out more. Usually in people's minds you have uh, power equals uh, revolutions times uh, uh, torque. There is a linear uh, relationship between power and RPM, so this is why we naturally think, well, I will increase RPMs and I will increase power. Let's talk about RPM and Formula One. RPM was actually unrestricted in F1 from the start all the way up to 2006, the time when that 20,000 RPM Cosworth came out. However, the FIA didn't want such high revving engines due to all of the costs involved, and in 2007 restricted RPM to 19,000. Then, along with V6s and hybrid engines, they reduced the RPM further to 15,000 from 2004 to 2021. But now, RPM is actually unrestricted once again, but manufacturers keep things at around 13,000 RPM. But more about why they do that later. So, are F1 engines the absolute pinnacle in terms of RPM? Well, actually, no, they're not. Just take a look at this crazy bike. It's the MTT Y2K Superbike, and Jay Leno has one. This is my Y2K motorcycle. You talk about losing control. <laughs> Well, it's, that's kind of what this is. It's got a jet engine in it. And yes, you heard that right. That's a motorbike with a jet, or more precisely, a turbo shaft engine, which is essentially a jet engine that drives a wheel. And this incredible machine revs at 52,000 RPM. However, it's not really a fair comparison as it uses a jet turbine rather than pistons, which means that it's actually easier to achieve that high RPM. So the jet engine is out and we're only gonna be focused on engines that have pistons. Now, we know that in racing, every millisecond and every decision matters. And that's precisely what you learn with today's sponsor, Brilliant. In their new data courses, you'll cover topics such as introduction to probability and modeling with multiple variables, where you can improve your ability to analyze and predict trends, just like engineers on the racetrack. Brilliant's learning platform is uniquely effective, helping to build your critical thinking skills through problem solving, not memorizing. And they have thousands of interactive lessons in maths, programming, AI, and more. Learning a little every day is one of the most important things you can do for personal and professional growth. If you'd like to build real knowledge in just a few minutes per day, then visit brilliant.org forward slash driver61 to start your free trial or scan the QR code on screen now. This gives you access to Brilliant free for 30 days and you'll also get 20% off an annual premium subscription. So if we want to stay strictly with reciprocating internal combustion engines, otherwise known as engines with pistons, we can look at two-stroke and four-stroke engines. As you know, with four-stroke engines, there's four main steps for a power cycle. Intake, when fresh air and fuel comes in, and the piston moves from top dead center to bottom dead center. Then compression, when the piston returns to top dead center, compressing the air-fuel mixture, followed by power, when the air-fuel mixture is ignited to combustion and forcing the piston all the way back down. And finally, exhaust, when the exhaust valve is open and the piston rises up once again to expel the resulting gases. Meanwhile, two-stroke engines are far simpler, completing their cycle in just two movements, compared to the four movements in a four-stroke engine, hence why they're called two-stroke, and four stroke. And that's why things like racing carts have a different sound. So as you can see, two strokes combine intake and exhaust in a single stroke, then compression and power in another. 
So that really means that two-stroke engines are doing half the work. They have a power stroke with every single revolution of the crankshaft and so can naturally rev higher, unlike the four-stroke which only fires once every two revolutions. So you might ask why we even need four-stroke engines. Well, there are downsides to two-stroke engines as they tend to be less fuel efficient. The problem is, is that as the intake and exhaust processes are combined in the same stroke, you don't get as much clean air in. Plus, two-stroke engines pollute more and wear out faster, as the lubricating oil is burning with the fuel. So, two-stroke engines can rev higher, but they have too many downsides for something like Formula 1. So, engineers have to stick with four-strokes. But, as always with engineers, this doesn't stop them from pushing everything to the absolute limits. So, why can't we get above this 20,000 RPM threshold? Well, one of the key things that limits RPM is the stroke length of the engine which leads to the bore to stroke ratio. The bore is the cylinder diameter and essentially also the piston diameter and the stroke is the distance between when the piston is at the top of its cycle and when it's at the bottom. The bore to stroke ratio, the bore diameter divided by the stroke length is also very important in engine design. If this ratio is one to one, then it's known as square because of how the cylinder ends up looking from the side. Just take a look at this diagram. Likewise, if you have a smaller than one ratio, it's known as under square and bigger than one is over square. So just take a look at this F1 piston and conrod and notice how wide the piston is and how short the conrod is. That means that F1 engines are actually over square, having a ratio between two and 2.4 which in turn allows the engines to have massive power while the physical size remains quite small. But more importantly, with a shorter stroke, the piston has a shorter distance to travel per revolution of the crankshaft. And with less distance to travel up and down, the piston itself is moving at a slower speed and that helps RPM significantly. When they run very fast, you need to limit the, the, the stroke so the, the mean velocity of the piston will lower down. You need to um, go for higher RPMs, but at the same time, you don't want to have high linear velocities of the pistons too high, so the stress, mechanical stress, won't go too high. And of course, mechanical stress is a big concern in engine design, because if we're trying to achieve the highest RPM possible, there's a higher chance that the internals, the pistons, the conrod, and so on, could bend, break, or smash into each other. And there are multiple ways that these bits and pieces can break. First, we have something called creep. Creep is when an engine part slowly changes shape over time. Just imagine heating up and pulling on a rubber band over and over again. Eventually, that band will change shape and become weaker. And for an internal engine part with the tiny tolerances in an F1 engine, that's a problem. As if an internal part gets bigger and weaker, it will very likely break. Another way F1 engines can break is by fatigue failure. Just take a look at this model of a crankshaft deforming. A small version of this happens every time the crankshaft rotates and fatigue failure happens when these small stresses build up over time and lead to the material cracking before eventually breaking. Now, F1 is on the cutting edge of technology, so it uses strengthened materials such as aluminium and titanium alloys. These materials are incredibly strong and light, meaning they're less likely to break through fatigue, but they also deal with heat very well. And when an F1 engine can get up to 2,600 degrees centigrade, that's very helpful. But in order to rev over 20,000 RPM, the problems aren't just down to the material strength. The next potential problem is with the engine's valves. As you know, valves allow fuel and air into the combustion chamber and exhaust gases out of it. But if the engine is revving too high, traditional sprung valves won't actually have time to close properly, which means they're still open when the piston comes back up before it smashes into the open valve. And as you might expect, that isn't good. However, F1 did solve this problem when Renault started using pneumatic valves in 1986, meaning they could hit the top of the valves harder, but get it to close the game faster and out of the way of the piston that's coming up. I outline more about that in our What If F1 Engines Had No Rules video. However, even pneumatic valves would have issues with wear, stress, and heat. Don't forget that thin piece of metal is traveling up and down 167 times per second. But beyond material strength, heat management, and valve technology, another critical factor limiting F1 engines from high RPMs is the efficient mixing of air and fuel in the combustion chamber. Now, fuel is injected inside the combustion chamber where it's mixed with air and ignited 
ignited by the spark plug. And for the combustion to be effective and powerful, the right amounts of air and fuel must be present in the chamber at the right time. And there must be sufficient time for them to mix, ignite and burn completely. Just take a look at this slow motion video of a power cycle. And the thing to note here is that there's a physical limit to how quickly the fuel and air can mix. There's just no getting around that. At 20,000 RPM, each cylinder in a four stroke engine completes a full intake, compression, combustion and exhaust cycle in just 0 0.003 of a second. And that's a tiny amount of time to do all of that and for the fuel and air to mix. And if the mixing doesn't happen properly, it's possible that there are areas of the mixture that are too rich with too much fuel or too lean with too little fuel. And that means that the fuel might ignite unevenly and damage the engine again leading to lower RPM. In an ideal world, the ratio of air to fuel you'd inject into the cylinder is 14.7 to 1. This is called the stoichiometric mixture and it's the perfect ratio to ensure all the fuel is burnt properly. Now, it is possible just to add more fuel and run rich, which can increase RPM and protect the engine against overheating because it has more fuel in there. But this only works up until a point. If you keep on adding more and more fuel, you'll end up wasting fuel and then fouling other components. So mixing the fuel as well as possible is very important when trying to get as much power and RPM as we can. And in 2015, a new technology turned up in Formula One. Just take a look at this. This is TJI or turbulent jet ignition and it changed how combustion happens in F1. Basically, there's a smaller chamber on top of the cylinder to which a spark plug is attached. And you can see that just here. A small quantity of fuel and air are injected into this pre-chamber where the spark plug then ignites the mixture inside the pre-chamber. And at the bottom of this chamber, it has six to eight nozzles that are smaller than a millimeter in diameter. Once ignited, the mixture then comes out of those small nozzles, which then propagates throughout the main chamber that's also filled with air and fuel. And this ignites the rest of the mixture along the way. That means that rather than a single point of ignition like this, with TJI, we have multiple points of ignition that penetrate into the cylinder just like this. And that means that the mixture is burnt faster and more uniformly, reducing the risk of those hot spots and unburnt fuel areas that we mentioned earlier. It also means a more even temperature distribution inside the chamber, which helps reduce the chances of overheating all things you need when trying to increase RPM. However, reaching such high RPM also requires overcoming the pre-mentioned mechanical, material and thermal issues. And while TJI is critical for modern high RPM engines, the other issues that we have, mainly with the material strengths, would stop the engines getting over that 20,000 RPM mark. I spoke to an ex-Red Bull powertrains designer to ask what he'd make if F1 engines had no rules. And he thought we might get over 4,000 horsepower. Watch that video just here. Thanks again to Maria for the interview and her knowledge, and thanks to you for watching.